On the telephone line, I welcome to the program a legendary American drummer whose work is best known with the band Dixie Dregs, the Steve Morse Band, and Winger. I welcome to the program uh, the great uh, Rod Morgenstein. Rod, Brian C., thanks for being on. Hey, Brian, pleasure to be here. Good morning. Good morning. My pleasure. Uh, Rod, uh, going over your music uh, resume, no question it's an epic one, voted by the readers of Modern Drummer magazine as one of the very best prog rockers to ever hit the skins. And uh, just wondering, when you look back at that 13-year-old Long Island kid playing music, is this what you envisioned what your future life would be? You know what? Um, My life was defined in a moment back in 1964 in February uh, when the Beatles played on the Ed Sullivan Show, um, my parents, sister, and I used to religiously watch the show. And so uh, on one of those Sunday evenings, Ed Sullivan said, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Beatles. And um, w- within moments, I turned you know, to my parents and my sister Carol. I said, That's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be a drummer. And... Um, I, you know, I never looked back, and I had the most wonderful, supportive parents who um, actually, um, but, you know, until the day, that, the day they both passed six months apart in um, 2020, they saw me perform every Long Island concert and New York area concert that I ever played, basically, um, from 1976 until 2018, which is the last time I played on Long Island uh, with um, the Dixie Dregs that got together to do a 40-year reunion of the very original band from the first album, Freefall. Amazing. And, you know, you mentioned the Beatles. I mean, uh, reading your career, uh, not only Ringo, but you had other several influences uh, which appealed to you, like uh, Mitch Mitchell of Hendrix was uh, your favorite, I believe, and also Clive Bunker of of Tull, right? Oh, absolutely. So, um, uh, unfortunately... I never got to see Jimi Hendrix play live, although growing up, you know, um, 30 miles from New York City, every week all of these supergroups were playing somewhere in New York City, you know, mostly at the Fillmore East, and I go in a lot with my friends, um, but I I remember even seeing, oh, Jimi Hendrix with the Band of Gypsies, he's playing New Year's Eve, ah, we'll see him next time, and then, you know, of course, um, he died, but... I saw Jethro Tull every time they played uh, in and around New York, you know, during those, say, the first four albums. Uh, they were life-changing for me. And um, uh, about three years ago, um, I went to see Martin Barr. He was the guitarist for most of the tenure uh, in Jethro Tull. He was doing Martin Barr's 50 Years of Jethro Tull. And I went to the concert, and there was um, um, Clive playing drums with another drummer, and so um, it was such a thrill for me, and then I got to spend time with him after the show. Uh, What a gentleman, and he still is playing better than ever. Oh, absolutely, and I know Martin Barr very well. I mean, he's such a a great artist, but so humble. I mean, unbelievable. Such a great personality, Martin Barr. I I have to tell you a great story about Martin Barr. So... um, um, back around 1980-81, uh, when the Dixie Dregs, I think Unsung Hero, Unsung Heroes album was out, we got so excited because we were told that our booking agency got us onto the Jethro Tull tour for, I don't know if it was going to be a month or two. So we were freaking out. Um, oh no, it was during the, um, Industry Standard album where we did a couple of vocal tunes. Um, and then we were really, really um, disappointed when we got word that when Ian Anderson found out that we don't actually have a singer in our band, and when we do Crank It Up, which was the vocal song that we got airplay with, with Alex Lidgertwood from Santana singing, um, we would just have our crew bring up a dummy with a dregs hat and a dregs shirt, and then we had the vocals on tape. And it was more like a joke, but when he found that out, uh, he had us nixed from the tour. Okay, so that was like around 1982. So fast forward, maybe um, 15 years later, 20 years later, 
I went to see Jethro Tull play on Long Island at the Jones Beach Theater. Um, and after the show, I went backstage, um, you know, to say hello to whoever in the band I could meet. And it was a thrill because I got to meet Ian Anderson. But um, I, I was chatting with Martin Barr, and he reminded me. He said, you know, Rod, I remember back in the early 80s, uh, we were going to be taking out the Dixie Dregs as a support band. And his words were, I was quaking in my boots at the thought of following Steve Morse on guitar. Really? And he said... I was so overjoyed when I got the word that you guys were dropped from the tour. Is that, is that a fact? Wow. Well, what a humble guy, you know, because he's, he's a monster. And I know oh, that, um, unbelievable. that Steve Morris loves Martin's playing, and he used to rave about Martin's guitar tone. Oh, he's he's unbelievable, and and you know he does a great performance live, and he still is so fluid on the guitar. I mean, it's just unbelievable. What a talent, no question. Uh, we're talking with the legendary American drummer uh, Rod Morgenstein, who's on the telephone line. Now, uh, Rod, in the very beginning of your pro career, um, did you ever incorporate in your style of playing a little bit of Clive Bunker, a little bit of Mitchell? Uh, did you ever incorporate their style in the very beginning of your career? I mean, absolutely. I made every effort to, and I think, you know, consciously or unconsciously, every musician does that. We all have our favorites, and then, um, you know, we spend a lot of time copying their licks, and initially you play the exact licks, and then hopefully over time uh, you begin to morph those specific licks into your own kinds of things, but just kind of, you know, playing in the spirit of uh, of your idols, so you know absolutely. Um, th the thing that I loved so much about Mitch Mitchell's drumming is, um, well, I seem to have an affinity for drummers that play in rock but come from a jazz background, so they bring this different kind of sensibility with them. But with Mitch Mitchell, Mitchell, he loved to mix up what they call duples and triples, so music either feels straight where you can divide the pulse by two or four, like do 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 ba do 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 ba or where you can divide it in threes, which is what gives you, like, the blues, like doom doom da doom doom do 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 or shuffles, you know, do do ba do 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 ba triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. And he's one of the only drummers where throughout a piece of music, one drum fill will be all duple based, and then it'll be followed by a fill that is all triplet-based. And it creates this incredible musical tension and excitement. And so I've incorporated that uh, concept uh, into my drumming and in, in, in a lot of the things that I do. And, um, so now your, your pro music yeah, go ahead. career... Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, and you know, the same thing with Clive Bunker. Just um, I went through a period where he was hands down... Uh, my favorite guy. There's just something so unusually different about him. His drumsticks were so short. They were the shortest sticks I'd ever seen a drummer play with. But also, he had a jazz background. Yeah, and you know, and you know, just reading also, I mean, you know, your pro music career began in the mid '70s, '75, I believe. And I'm just thinking, you know, I was a little boy at that time, so I don't know how the business was. I I do know that there was a lot of there must have been a lot of competition back then. I mean, you had people like a piece, Carmine a piece. You had like Marky Ramone, Richie Ramone. I mean, who did you have a main com competitor at that time? I mean, as far as a ba you know, with the Dixie Dregs, there there really were no competitors because um, we were in that you know special niche of musicians playing instrumental music. The focus was not on the singer or the lyrics; it was just on the music itself and then the individual performers. You know, we had the the handful of bands and musicians that um, that we looked up to, like the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Um, with John McLaughlin and Billy Cobham was the drummer, Jerry Goodman playing electric violin, who years later joined the Dixie Dregs, which was uh, one of the most exciting experiences for all of us. Um, 
you know, Chick Corea's return to forever and all the guys in his band that went off to do amazing solo things. Of course, uh, Jeff Beck was there. Um, but it wasn't like, uh, you know, we ever thought of it as a competition. Um, it was just, uh, you know, like these young musicians striving to be able to um, put together a career of sorts, just to, the concept of actually being able to make a living uh, playing the music that was closest to our heart um, and, and surviving somehow, you know. And um, with music and with the arts, uh, you know, having some uh, modicum of talent is only part of it. You really do have to catch lucky breaks now and then where, where a door opens up, you know, and you move to um, the next level. And, and I do apologize if there's a little delay. It seems like we're having a, I'm having a little technical difficulty. Um, so it's, it's sort of a blessing the way your pro music career begins in the 1970s. I mean, you happen to meet lead guitarists since 1994 of Deep Purple, Steve Morse in college, and he asked you to sit in. How did you react to that invite? Well, okay, so um, when I first went to the University of Miami, I went down there in my third year, and I was struggling with – trying to decide if I really want to continue uh, the path of playing drums or I had, I had gained this love of piano, and in particular jazz piano, and um, I couldn't decide if I maybe wanted to go in a piano direction. And so I, I took some classes where I was able to learn about improvisation, you know, with melodies and chords, you know, uh, not just rhythm. And so I was in this improv class, and um, I'm playing piano, and there were maybe between 10 and 15 guitarists in there, and the teacher was always yelling at this one guitarist because he was the only guitarist that didn't play, you know, a hollow-body, fat Gibson guitar with, all, with just all the treble turned off. So it was Steve Morris, you know, playing what's famously become known as the Frankentelli, um, which is a Telecaster, and then, you know, Steve um, did all kinds of modifications on it with a Stratocaster neck and Gibson frets, and he was the one that I was admiring. He didn't sound like any of the other guitarists in the class. He just sounded like this unique, one-of-a-kind monster, and... Um, so I didn't know him. He didn't know me. But one day he came over to me and said, hey, Rod, um, somebody told me you play the drums. Um, the drummer in my band, uh, Bart Yarnold, he's a surfer, and he just heard himself surfing. Uh, could you maybe fill in for Bart until he heals? And I said, sure. But now I had no idea what I was walking into. And uh, I went to this rehearsal. Um, they were actually a class called the Rock Ensemble Number no. 2, but it was, it was a band playing mostly Steve's music. And back then, um, I remember like, uh, like some of the things that I was learning of his were Country House Shuffle, um, The Odyssey, um, can't even think. But I thought I had died and gone to heaven because the music that was coming out of Steve Morse, his musical creations, to me, um, were, were as magnificent as any piece of music I had ever heard before in my life. And so um, the band also played, uh, you know, a few cover tunes like Peaches and Regalia from Frank Zappa and maybe an Allman Brothers song. Um, but then things got a little uncomfortable because Bart, the surfer drummer, he healed, and then we tried to play as a double drumming band, um, but it, it clearly wasn't working out. It, Bart was a, a great rock drummer, but he wasn't a, a drummer that came from a jazz background or a fusion background. And, um, and so he graciously bowed out of it. Um, it was kind of awkward, and I felt really, really badly about it. Um, but he said, hey, man, this is more you know, up your alley, go for it. And that's kind of how the whole thing started for me. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years later, some of us graduated 
And uh, we looked at each other and said, wow, what are you going to do now for the rest of your life? You know, I don't know, maybe go to Nashville, maybe go back to New York or California. Those seem to be the choices for musicians trying to get a career going. So we said, hey, should we give it a shot? You know, all for one, one for all, try to make it with our one-of-a-kind instrumental music that you can't dance to. And this was in the height of the disco era, you know, mid-70s. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we were green around the ears. We thought that the world was going to embrace our music that had no lyrics or singing and, uh, you know, would venture into all kinds of different time signatures that you can't tap your feet to. Um, and so a few months into it, um, Steve had about 35 rejection letters um, tacked up on the wall of his kitchen from record labels kind of saying, are you guys joking? You don't have a chance. Give it up. You know, get a real job. And, um, you know, as depressing as it was, um, I think it was in part, you know, the imp impetus for us to push forward even harder to prove to the world that, even though we play esoteric music, we are going to forge ahead. And, um, and really, sooner than later, um, we had one of those doors open, one of those lucky breaks. Um, back then, uh, bands were actually paid 100 bucks sight unseen, to play clubs, where now it's horrible. It's almost like pay-to-play. But we were on a circuit. We were playing a club in Nashville called the Exit Inn. And uh, we're in the middle of our show, and then someone in the band called a quick powwow and said, look over at the bar, it's the keyboard player from the Allman Brothers, Chuck Lavelle. Um, and the Allman Brothers in the 70s were huge. So um, we kicked it into high gear, we finished our set, and then Chuck Lavelle and the person he was with, Twigs Linden, um, who uh, was their production manager, they came running over to us and said, who are you guys, and where can we buy your records? This was, like, wow. amazing. We never heard anything like it. And we said, we don't have a record deal. And to their credit, they said, oh, you're getting a record deal. First thing tomorrow morning, we're calling Capricorn Records, speaking to Phil Walden, you know, who is the president of the label, and uh, we're going to move this thing forward. And um, true to their word, like a month later, we played a concert at a club in Macon, Georgia, and the entire record label came out to see this band that uh, Chuck Lavelle and Twigs Linden were raving about. And uh, uh, um, Phil Walden shook our hands and said, boys, you got yourselves a record deal. And that's how the whole thing started. And, um, I, you know, I can't say enough for, like, uh, aspiring musicians that say, how do you... How do you make it happen? The way you make it happen is by not staying idle. You have to keep creating music and just get it out there however way you can. And in addition to now, you know, harnessing technology and doing videos and, and getting it up on YouTube and all those kind of things, you have to be, um, um, you know, getting your live performance chops together. So even though there's no money in it, at all, and, and you have to, uh, you know, spend an entire day humping your gear to get it to the venue, set it up, then play however long you play, and then reverse the process. <laughs> you have to do it um, because today um, it's all about live performance. That's the way that um, musicians um, kind of make, make their living. It's not from selling records. Everybody knows that, you know, nobody or very few people spend money on recordings anymore. It used to be how you made a, a nice part of your living, but it's a record now is more of a, uh, a marketing tool. It's just uh, it's a it's an advertisement to let people know that you're current and you're staying creative and, you know, coming up with new stuff. Now, I have but a that, couple, and that's uh, why so many bands are out there on the road. And in fact, on Wednesday, I'll be, you know, be leaving for most of the next three weeks with Winger, uh, playing mostly in the, in the middle of the country. 
Yeah, and I was going to ask you, Rod, uh, you know, what's in the pipeline? Uh, you know, what, what are you doing currently? What's in the near future for you? Yeah, okay. So, um, so uh, Winger is very active. Uh, we've been working on a new uh, recording for the last, uh, wow, it's coming up on two years. So it'll probably come out in the first part of next year. Uh, a lot of great music. Um, uh, you know, we've always prided ourselves on our recordings. You know, since the good old days, you know, where you used to sell millions of records, we've put out three studio recordings. And, you know, it, to us, there's not a weak track in the recording. So it's not, oh, yeah, let's just write ten songs and put it out there. Uh, we, we always go to great pains to try to make amazing music. And so... Um, uh, this year, we've been doing a lot of shows with Skid Row and Warrant, and then sometimes Lita Ford and Quiet Riot, uh, because it's like the more the merrier. Um, to go out just on your own, um, uh, you know, your fan base will come out to see you. But when you put three or more bands together, all of a sudden it becomes a happening, and um, people come out of the woodwork, and, and you get crowds in the thousands. And so it's it's wonderful, you know. So I'm doing that, um, but um, I'm also in the process uh, with a partner of launching um, um, a company that um, is going to be um, offering like one-of-a-kind drum tools to solve the, the handful of problems that every drummer deals with. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a hobbyist or a full-time professional drummer, things go wrong. You can't finger tighten things tight enough, or if you haven't loosened a wing nut in a while, you can't without using a, a pair of pliers or putting your two t sticks together uncomfortably. You can't loosen the wing nut. And that, that's one of several things that every drummer wrestles with. And so, um, you know, I've, I've had... Um, success for many years with these isolation headphones uh, that help protect a drummer and you can listen to the music very quietly and uh, you know they're available through Vic Firth for the last 15 or 20 years and then also like for 30 years I've had this idea um, for tools because I know um, that there's a desperate need for them and I can't understand why no one has figured it out. And so we're hoping to be launching later this year. Um, it's really been the last three years of a lot of work going into getting prototype after prototype together. And so I'm very excited um, that that's coming together. And then um, about 10 years ago or so, you know, I was a professor at Berkeley College of Music for 20 years where I'd commute the 250 miles each way um, to teach up there, um, but towards the end of my 20 years, I retired about four years ago, uh, they created their online division so people can study from anywhere in the world, and they asked me if I'd create uh, what probably will be the world's first um, three-credit college course in rock drumming. And so, um, so I spent the better part of a year doing that about 10 years ago, and uh, it's available uh, through Berkeley's online um, website. And so uh, the online courses, of which they have a couple of hundred now, um, they run 12 weeks, so four times a year. And a couple weeks ago, I just started the summer session. So I'm also the teacher of it, of the course that I created. And uh, it's wonderful. You know, once a week, you, um, you have like a live class where whoever's available from wherever they are in the world, they kind of tune in. The rest of the week, everybody's on their own to just go through all of the material that's in the course. It's very, very thorough. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of musically transcribed drum parts to songs from hundreds of different, different artists, and there's play-along tracks that I created uh, for, for students to, um, to record themselves to and videotape themselves and send them in. Um, so that's an ongoing thing, um, and it's really cool to be talking to people who are coming, you know, to me 
from their apartments or homes, like in China or um, the South American countries all over Europe. So, um, one minute. So, um, yeah, you know, so, so that's something um, that's, uh, that's part of my weekly routine. And um, next month, yeah, just very quickly, uh, one of the longtime crew members of the Dixie Dregs, uh, his name was Scoots Linden, he was Twig's brother, he passed away two years ago, and we're doing a memorial service for him in Macon, Georgia, uh, and all of the musicians from the various bands he played in are going to make every effort to come together to perform. So I think this might be the very last time that those five Dixie Dregs, including Steve Morse, um, meet in Macon, uh, rehearse for a day, and then play a handful of songs. So it's going to be very emotional. That's so, Rod, you know, before, no, before I let you go, from what I understand, we have about 87,000 streaming uh, the, the program uh, during these hours. Please mention your website. Oh, sure. Okay, so um, uh, it's rodmorgenstein.com, and then uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I think it's Rod Morgenstein Official. Um, I, I wish I were more, you know, IT savvy. I don't spend enough time um, in, in that aspect of things, but uh, but uh, it's never too late. And uh, I just want everybody to know that I'm still a very very active musician. I, there's no reason to not play, no matter what age you are, as long as you're physically able to do it, because it's the greatest thing um, um, that that you can ever imagine doing. There's so much pleasure in it. Right, it was definitely an honor for me. I really appreciate your time this morning. Oh, it's so wonderful talking with you, Brian. Absolutely. Uh, take care of yourself. Best of luck. All right. You too. Take care now. Take care. You just Bye-bye. heard uh, the one and only Rod Morgenstein. Until next week, happy collecting to all.